Welcome to Building Conversations, a construction podcast powered by the STO Building Group. On today's episode, Allison Smith, a member of STO's corporate marketing team, will be speaking with our Advanced Coordination Team, or ACT. They're a team of virtual design and construction experts who have a unique approach to using BIM and BDC to solve construction problems. get started. I have the pleasure of sitting here in Boston with our ACT team and they are here with me now. Clayton Lyons, Donal Lyons, and Zenan Zhang. Hi Allison. Clayton, let's start the conversation with you and how this all began. Virtual design and construction I think has become more mainstream in the last few years but you've been in this business for decades. How'd you get started in this? (laughs) Um, I started when I got discharged from the Marine Corps. I uh, was accepted into local Union 12, Plumbers Union, here in Boston, and I did my apprenticeship, but the biggest thing that got me started was the people that were mentoring me. Everybody is a product of their mentoring, uh, everyone we know, and I had some very unique individuals that thought way outside of the box, uh, taught me engineering is the code practice. So whatever's written in the code in order to solve things, it always reverts back to engineering status or techniques. So a lot of the things that we started to do here was address common problems on job sites. So the typical process of BIM has been monitoring subcontractors. Uh, What we actually do is we jump in ahead of the purchase of subcontractors and work with the design teams in order to come up with a set of coordinated drawings so that we can actually get going much faster in the process. Is that something you learned when you were a tradesman? Like to to work with the team that way? Or is that something that came to you later when you started doing this on your own? Um, It came probably when I got into the engineering business. I started working for a mechanical engineer, a very large mechanical engineering firm. And I was designing and I started to understand what design teams go through. So being a tradesman, being out in the field, working with the tools and everything, um, you didn't have that respect for the design team or that understanding for the design team. Once I was in that seat, I started to understand that if we all collaborated, we could actually come up with a buildable set of documents and save a lot of time and effort, change orders and everything else that we suffer through right now with all the RFIs and issues that pop up out in the field. So now by taking that process, getting involved with the architect and the engineers, the minute we get the project, allows us to eliminate that whole setup and stop looking into more fabrication of process. Taking care of the owner, you know, just taking care of uh, the issues, seeing them and figuring out how to resolve them. And so then when you brought Donal and Zenon, kind of into the fold is that the approach that you know that you were teaching them as they got started in the business yes so the three guys that taught me that's who's teaching them plus a little bit of my twist in the three of us we're learning every day for the rest of our lives this is an industry where you don't start school till the day you're hired so you can go to school to be a financial expert and come out and be a financial expert Uh, Here, you have to learn this business the day you start. There is no school that teaches it or can give that understanding to these guys. Everything with Donal and Zena was pretty much baptismal by fire, Mm -hmm. and they learned so much more than anybody in the industry could possibly learn from working with the engineers, the architects, and the tradesmen. So they're completely interactive with designers and field personnel, plumber, foreman, pipe fitter foreman to knock a foreman. Um, and that relationship starts from the very beginning to the very end. So then Donal, let's bring you in here. In full um, transparency, you are Clayton's son. So <laughs> so did he make you get into this or was this something you were interested in anyway? Uh, kind of came about in a, in a funny way. Um, starting back in high school, I had a mid-grade for a biology class and um, I wasn't doing too well and my my mom and dad decided that for my vacation I was going to spend that vacation going to work with my dad and 
going into the office, he showed me what he was doing and programs he was using, and he put me under kind of the tutelage of one of the people working in his group at the time, and I just started liking it right off the bat and learning from them and their group, and it was a really cool experience, and though I don't have my formal education in it, I came out and worked my summers and kept learning and learning, and then when I got out of college, had an opportunity to come here and work for him again, and I jumped at it. So what um, what did you get your formal education in? Political science and government, so, you know, not really <laughs> applicable in, in what I'm doing, but, you know, my dad and my mom had told me going to college, you know, study something that you're interested in, but as my dad had said, when you come out, this will be a, an option for you as well, but go out there and explore, and I took that opportunity to do it in college. Did you kind of have in the back of your mind that you thought you'd end up here anyway, or, or were you just open? I certainly explored different options, but I, I landed back that this is exactly what I wanted to do with my career. No day is the same as the last, at least from my experience, and do not regret that at all. And I would imagine you were kind of getting into this right when it was becoming more the mainstream, you know, when BIM became kind of the big buzzword. Was yeah. that right around when you were getting into this? Yeah, absolutely. It was getting from 2D drafting to 3D coordination, and it was becoming adopted more mainstream, and it was becoming almost a necessity for any project. So I really caught it on the upswing. It, mm -hmm. was, it was pretty interesting. Zena, how about you? You came into it similar timing when it was becoming the yeah. new thing, but I think you came at it from a different angle than these guys. Yeah, first of all, I'm not related with us, <laughs> but we work as a family. I came like pure like academic BIM background. Um, I did research with my professor while I was pursuing my master's degree in civil engineering. When I just started getting hot about BIM, and we wrote about like 80 to 100 pages of thesis about BIM and everything. So it was a hot topic. I was able to land a job, but I was really hands off taking any job related to BIM because while I was doing that, I kind of have a feeling there's a missing link because in the academic world, they told you was this model and a software you can build a building without no really having a construction knowledge. So I'm feeling there's something missing in between and I don't think I handle that job like when I was started looking for job, although I got a lot of job offers related to BIM. So until I met Clayton, he said how he did BIM, linked those field experience and then your modeling skills together and then we did a lot of pre-coordination stuff and then kind of linked them together. So I was like, this is missing link and that's how I got into it. And then I started working with him seven years ago and then it's been working well. So then maybe you can describe for us over this last seven years plus what it is that your team does. What is, does the ACT team do? So we try to get involved with the design team really early. And then with that, we try to come up with a pre-coordinated design. So when the subs get them, they can start installation and fabrication. That's what we call pre-coordination of what we do. And then if we get involved during the co uh, coordination process, during the construction, instead of doing the clash detection only, we try to come up with solutions on any of the issues on site and we work with the subs and design team closely and then interactive coordination instead of just doing, uh, purely doing the clash detection and also if there's any issues come up last minute on site from the design team or the owner, they call us and then we work with them and come up with a solution instead of like waiting for R5 or you know any design pending approvals. And then this is what we call a reactive coordination. So th those are main three th services we provide. So are you saying that you guys can be involved with using a model to help before the construction starts? Yep. And then like solve problems while the construction is happening and then even addressing more stuff after? Yep, we solve the problems before the construction actually starts. And then when the subs get the drawings, those drawings are already coordinated, so they don't need to verify any issues they spot on the drawing. So there are no change orders needed if it's already working out. So that's when we try to get involved already, but there are some projects we couldn't get involved already in the design phase because of timing. So we came in and we provided solution, best solutions for all trades, and sometimes we work with the design team saying, just shorten the process and provide a solution so they can start moving forward with the project. So how is the approach you guys take different from, say, a normal, traditional BIM process where the architect has their model and the 
subs have theirs and you have yours. How is your process different? What most BIM processes are is they put a guy in there that understands how to clash detect with the software, which is typically Navis works. The subs then begin drawing and then this individual manages that model, brings it together, does clash detection, projects it up onto the screen with the subs, points out that there's hits or clashes with system to system, and then next week they do it again and hope that some of that is resolved. Then they leave it up to the subcontractors to go back and do that. Um, the process that we're doing when we're doing a typical BIM process, we're not brought on during the design phase, is we do the same thing pretty much. And once there's a clash, we just tell them to keep moving. We manipulate it, get back to that individual sub that afternoon. They incorporate it and we're doing it right off the bat. We're signing off weeks ahead of the regular process. I see. So rather than just detect clashes, you guys help solve them, right. fix yeah. them, move on. And that's also a good point because I think the world is trying to, when you're in school, BIM is that you know the software, which is called Navis Work, you know how to model in Revit, and then you can use BIM. You're that's, a BIM person. Yeah, you're yeah. a BIM person. But we just have a PM will come up like next uh, next couple of weeks, and then he said, like he asked us, how, how much time do I need for the training for the Navis Work? I said two hours. So maximum, like that's that's what it is. It's like, so using the software is not a key. You put the regular coordination into the three D representation, and that's about it. So the problem solving is really where your field experience and knowledge of the fittings and all that right. stuff. These comes guys, in. they know how to build a building. Donald Zenon understand HVAC systems, heating pipe systems, plumbing systems, and their codes and the engineering background. It's a lot for. Uh, people of this age didn't know and like I said everything is uh, baptismal by fire these guys are working sometimes on ten, 10 different kinds of buildings per year where a typical process a guy's on one building for three years so Donald or Zena could be working on a hospital a lab a hotel and a art museum all at the same time and totally understanding the system requirements for those specific buildings. So given that, can you guys walk us through maybe an example from a project, like how your process helps solve problems? So we built a 27 floor tower for one of our healthcare clients. It was a skewed shape of building. It's really hard for the coordination to start with. So actually that project, the design team requested to bring us on board already. They had a meeting with us really early, even before they finalized the design. And we did a pre-coordination with them, and we spotted some issues. So before the subs on board, we were able to come up with a fully pre-coordinated drawing. So within a week, we were able to sign off two floors, and then they started fabrication and installation almost right when they were on board. The, the change orders we were able to avoid is like millions of dollars and then uh, we eliminated a lot of our advice too because those problems were already solved before um, you know the drawings being released. That's a successful project and then even uh, the owner said to us without you guys like this building wouldn't be up right now so. Plus you helped with all that problem solving and alone plus all the time that you just saved and the money that you just saved it just seems like a no-brainer. Yeah. The, they maintained 100% design intent. I'm glad you bring that up because I know one of the issues that I hear about in the whole VDC realm is you know, each project partner kind of wants to manage their own model and keep their information to themselves. So if part of your guys' approach is to get in early on the design, Donald, do you, do you ever have issues with design partners or other project partners not wanting to play that game? Absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of examples where, where we face pushback from the design side in terms of releasing models. I mean, in that phase of a project, it's, it's their intellectual property. And often on in process projects that they've been involved with before with other teams, 
I think they've experienced a lot of kickback and negative reactions. You know, their models are simply design intent. They're not meant to be coordinated to, they're not meant to show 110% accuracy. The reality is, is we understand that and we go in to the projects like that and we, we talk to those design teams and work with them to create a uh, atmosphere of trust and explaining to them that we're more concerned about the CD set, the construction documents. That's what we work off of. That's what we own in a project. It's not going to be based off of the model that they hand over to us. Once we've worked on a project with them, then it becomes a lot easier. Like we've worked with a lot of great design teams where we've established a really good working partnership. And that's how we go into a project is we're partners with you. Yeah, and, and keep, like you were saying, their design intent. You're, you guys are trying to make it real. Yeah. And absolutely. so same, same team, same goal. That's it. Uh, well, so Clayton, what about the subs? Do you ever have issues with them, you know, pushing back on the process? Uh, in the beginning, a few years back, maybe. Um, now, subs are very used to us. Uh, we're their peers. They're tradesmen. We're tradesmen. And we share the same language. That's one of the biggest things is sharing the same language. We're understanding the design talk, but we're also understanding the installation talk. They're two different languages altogether. We've been in a couple of situations where we've actually gone out, laid pipe, and hung stuff with the trade just to make sure because rough layout in some scenarios. But it also gives us the, the ability to stay current because fittings and things like that are changing just as much as software is. Yeah, so you guys are kind of like the translators in the middle that right. bring it all together. So speaking of that, what if you're on a job where you're not? we're not the only construction management firm like there's another GC on site or something how do you guys coordinate with them if maybe they don't approach VDC the same way oh, you do a perfect scenario on that yeah I mean we found ourselves in situations like that before where the contract is that we have the interior fit out aspect of the project and the other contractor has the corn shell and the reality is is we have the same client we have the same goal and in, in, in building the project and a lot of the aspects of a corn shell project affects what we're able to do in the interior fit out portion of, of our contract. So we are partners with them as well. And so we've had a project where we had a high profile tech client where we were building out a, a headquarters and we had another contractor doing the corn shell and they were doing beam penetrations in this very, very tight space in a, in a ceiling. And up front, we were able to work with them share information, share our resources with them to ensure that by the time their portion of the contract was met that we were able to perform our end of the contract. So we're not going in as competitors. We, we have to work as a team and collaborate with them to make sure that we can do the best job that we can. And does it matter or is it any kind of sort of issue that the way you guys approach the modeling and the virtual construction part of it may be different than the way they do? Or is it easy to bring those together? Or do you not even have to bring them together? We work with them to find the best practice. And so we show them what we're doing. They show us what they're doing. Um, complete transparency in the entire process because it, it benefits none of us to work against each other. So it's one of those things where this particular project that I've laid out, for example, we ended up sharing our FTP site and, and model sharing and everything like that and exchange of files and everything we were working on. So it just comes down to what the best practice is. I'm going to interject on that for a second. Donald's being a little modest here. <laughs> that particular contractor was doing the shell and core and because they hadn't had the subs on board yet and they understood what we were doing. And they asked their up-and-coming subcontractors work, plumbing, HVAC, and everything, in order to produce those beam pe penetrations for fabrication. So Donald was in there actually on their request doing the pre-coordination process before that general contractor had subcontractors on board. Wow. So it helped them yes. be more efficient and, and save time. And very happy. But them, yeah. but them being more efficient, them saving more time makes us more efficient, makes us save time. So again, it all boils down to what the end result is, and that's, that's a project that's built on time, on schedule, and on budget. That's a good segue, because I was just, I think you guys have kind of touched on it a little already, but... What are the benefits to doing it the way that you do it versus sort of that traditional way where we were talking about where it's just like clash detection and all that stuff? What are the benefits of doing it this way? So I think benefits of a project is only two aspects to the end. is One is money, the other one is time. <laughs> so when there's a delay of time for the coordination process, like either 
there is a conflict, no one can provide a solution, or there's an RFI we're waiting for design team to the answer. So we eliminated the RFI to start with, so there's less RFIs. And then even there's RFI, sometimes we work with the subcontractor, and then all we need to do is like send a confirming RFI to the design team. They turn around like usually really short time and saying this is good. So that saves us the time. And also when there's a hit on the site, instead of waiting for the doctor guy to resolve this situation, which when he moved, he made hit orders. We are trained to draw all trades. So when we working on a hit, we draw all trades, come up with a better one. So typically when they go with a traditional BIM, they sit on one hit for three, four months. Donald actually resolved the one one clash or one hit within two days. So. And I would imagine the efficiencies that your process brings in, they save the money that's related to the time, but I would think even through like fabrication and estimating and everything that it saves on ordering, you know, materials that you didn't end up needing or, or things like that. Yeah, like uh, the fabrication is a big thing for us. When we have to stop to work with us all the time, they come up with a habit when they got a drawing, they know it's gonna work and they start fabrication with our drawing and then we're like no you cannot start fabricating until you resubmit really it to the design team but that's the level of trust they have with they us know. And, yeah they know it's gonna work and just think about typically you have to wait like a month or two to coordinate like let's say big uh, project for a couple floors in order for you to release any of the fabrication but in those cases we pre-coordinated they know it's gonna work and they start fabrication right away mm -hmm. so those are the time saving as well so you bring up a good point too about really big projects versus other kinds are there kind are there types of projects that are more suitable for your process in other words like does what you guys do apply to everything would would everyone want to use it on their project or is it more appropriate for certain types of projects it definitely has it's, it's stronger impacts on specific projects, especially with, you know, we focus and we've talked about mainly coordinating mechanical systems because we know that mechanical portions of a project either make or break a project. 70% um, of cost overruns and, and uh, schedule delays are attributed to MEP related issues and coordination. So when we come in and start focusing on the MEP aspects, there are some projects that don't require a high level of, of focus on MEP. A hotel project, for instance, once you've coordinated one floor, you've essentially coordinated them all. But you look at labs and you look at healthcare facilities, they require knowledge of code, which is absolutely important, and um, different kinds of MEP systems that have either long lead items or are much more complicated and take a lot longer to coordinate. So there are projects like that that we manage to take on when we apply our process. A lot of TI work is mm -hmm. they jump into a building and they demo right away and then they have to install right away. So the process isn't too intuitive on something like that. It's not a, you know, it's probably we hold it up more than Don't need it, it really. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, especially in office space. You start getting into maybe renovating a complex lab or converting into a hospital space, um, then you're going to need to get in there and do some reconnaissance work and then pre-coordinate. When you have those kinds of projects, I know you've mentioned before, you've mentioned already like, you know, using tools like Navisworks and the, just the software itself. What are some of the, the other tools you use to kind of do that reconnaissance and assessment? <coughs> laser scanning. Laser scanning. Laser scanning has been around for a while, but it's incredibly effective in allowing us to 100% accurately identify a space that we're going to be coordinating in without having to send more people out there to take measurements and stuff like that. The cost of labor has now been significantly reduced because of using laser scanning, and it allows us to be accurate from a centralized location. We can work on a project down in Philadelphia from here with 110% accuracy because of tools like laser scanning, and so we use that a lot. And I know you just said it's been around a while, but it seems like in the last couple of years it's even progressed further. Where it used to be those like really big machines, they just you know put them down in just the right place and now there's guys walking around with little hand scanners dot products stuff like that yeah um, when the trades come on board we keep a active set of documents is they carry these hand scanners with them and weekly scan instead of redlining and then they send that scan to us and we make sure that they're installing in the place that they're signed off to install yeah you're kind of As monitoring day one yeah. mm -hmm. 
That's amazing. So now you guys, you've worked, like you said, you've worked with some major healthcare clients and big high profile projects. And I know you have a lot of repeat clients. What are they saying about this process when they work with you versus when they say they work with other firms? We've had very positive feedback from all of our clients so far. They're saving money, they're keeping their original design. The ability for our team to communicate with the contractors, the subcontractors, is a big deal. And uh, the client has seen us, witnessed it with us, and would like to somehow wrap that up and put it out in their RFPs from this point. And they understand that it's that it's difficult to get everybody to do that because there's not a team out there like this. And like I said, we handle very complex projects and come up with some very unusual resolve. So getting back to the technologies, how about all the influx recently in the last year or two of virtual reality, augmented reality, your I'm favorite these guys your favorite one, topic? I'll go, I'll go. <laughs> well, no, first I want to hear from you and then we can, okay. they can talk about it too. But um, I know you have a pretty strong stance on that. How do you think those tools fit into our field? First of all, I love new technology. And we research it and we go to a lot of different places to find it. But we're only going to get the technology that actually helps us be more productive and faster and more accurate at building a building, which is what we do. A lot of this stuff is a huge marketing toy. And a lot of software manufacturers have jumped on the bandwagon because now a new market opened up in the construction industry. So we've got goggles, and I, I love goggles, and I think in the architectural world, uh, goggles are great to work with the client. Uh, walking around on a job site with anything without a 100% unobstructed view, OSHA, is dangerous. And I don't like to see it on our jobs because I, I could just see a guy walking off the edge of the building or just tripping and you know getting hurt. But what makes us build the building accurately, faster, and be able to transfer that knowledge to the field so it can be done that way. That's, a, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for what is actually viable, what's actually going to help everyone involved right down to the installer. Zena or Donald, maybe in addition to what Clayton was saying, where do you see what you guys do going next? It's kind of tough to make that prediction because the landscape of technology, it's so quickly changing. You know, there's this notion of technology where just because it's technology, it makes things easier. But we have to remember that the parameters of a project don't change or haven't changed. You know, we still have to work within the same schedule parameters. They're not giving us more time to, to perform projects. And a matter of fact, often we're seeing that accelerated scheduling has grown significantly because of that notion of technology is making building faster and that's true in some ways but if you adopt technology it has to replace an existing process in those parameters and when you throw in new technology new technology new processes without replacing less effective ones you're just you're filling a glass until it spills over and and so that's why we stick to things like laser scanning where we have a direct return on using technology like that. You have to see it immediately to, to be able to use it. And so where technology is going, I really could not tell you. I don't have a crystal ball, but it seems like the whole machine learning thing is really what's driving a lot of the technology that's coming out. And we'll see what happens in the future. I think, you know, you were talking about, Clayton, the, the laser laying out of, of, of systems and stuff like that on a job site. Um, I think over time, in the next few years, we'll see more stuff like that start coming out. But we have to be very careful about the technology that we we adopt because it's changing so fast that it, it, by the time we adopt it, it's there really won't be a return on us using it. Well, and this industry, the construction industry, has a reputation of being like really slow to the game when it comes with innovation and advancement. And um, Clayton, you said it earlier that one thing that's been moving the needle that lately is that all these app developers and software developers who were not in our industry have realized this is ripe. You know, this this industry needs help. And so now all of a sudden there's a ton. Do you think that's a fair reputation or you know, I guess how do you see our industry interacting with technology going forward? Fabrication is the next step. Faster fabrication. Uh, Pre-coordination creates more fabrication because of the time 
that it's done it. Now to work on more maybe robotic fabrication or getting into uh, there's unitized fabrication, but unitized the industry has to catch up. And what I mean by that is when we talk about unitized fabrication is fittings, hangers, things have to change in order to be able to do that kind of accurate fabrication. So a little bit more uh, 3D printing on hanger materials, stuff like that, and working with some of these manufacturers on customizing certain fittings, certain elements of the building to be built that we can get exactly what we need to make it work. Um, Maybe so, like outside of their normal fabrication process or right. something? Like get out of the 3D catalog. Printer yeah. Or, yeah. So whatever's in the catalog sometimes just doesn't work and there's ways of 3D laser printing to get a fitting or whatnot to, to make it work. Metal printing that we were told doesn't exist. In this industry it doesn't, but in the military it does. So that's something that the three of us are looking at to kind of get into and see what we can utilize it for. So there's a lot of things that we're looking into technology-wise. It's not all software. I think software is great, but a lot of good foremen out there do not want to be flying through a model, nor do I want to pay them to be flying through a model when they should be laying out and being able to look up in the ceiling and know what's going up there. So it's, it's like, like a combination of mm. both. Yeah. yeah. It's, there's toys, and it's great for nice marketable images, but does it work? Yeah. I do agree that construction industry is a little bit delayed on the technology side only because the technology won't help you to know how to pitch a pipe and everything. It's like it's knowledge. So where the technology goes, a lot of good things will help us. And then also I think there will be a phase down the line. Everybody will be calmed down on the technology saying, okay, we only will pick and choose what will help us to make it go faster. But eventually your knowledge and then how to build a building is the key. So you don't see like a fleet of robots building a giant building? I mean, um, <laughs> I'm not right, right away. It, it's, it will be great. <laughs> uh, we've, we've looked at some of the fab well uh, robots so far and they're struggling. Um, but, and it does amazing things, but it just doesn't you need really that human have element. it yet. Right. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. have it yet. Job layout is a big one. I'd like to see technology go down where our information is in the building wirelessly everywhere and I'm talking for layout that would be something that could be eliminating t tape measures we're getting there it, I was gonna say it seems like we're heading in that direction with the Internet of Things and the smart buildings and sensors being installed and you know yep. everywhere in yes. every new building let's say we have a large list but I mean the realistic list is the one which is just gets us to build the building correctly yeah I don't think robots is gonna be that solution. Robots are going to be a huge expense. They're going to break down. They're going to have to be fixed. So, I mean, we're, we're still, still need people so right. far. We're, Jobs it are it safe. sounds like we're going to be adding people more than anything if, you know, potentially there's maintenance and everything else. So, you know, when when I see it working, then I'll, I'll be happy with it. But I'm not a robotics major, so I'm going to stick with <laughs> what works for my guys out in the field now, you know. Yeah. But the robotics thing, and we've been talking about this, is like, even like 3D printing for fabrication, there are a lot of aspects involved, and not just printed out, because you have to have the safety inspection and everything. So when those technologies come in, I think it's a good picture. You think, okay, this is going to work, print out a fitting to the right size and everything, but there will be other aspects like safety involved, of who's going to be responsible if there's a leak for the fitting and joint. Yeah, that and then, be one. you know, so one side will say, okay, this is the supplier, and then the other side will be the printer. So I think it's just a lot of aspect involved in, in, instead of just saying we can build a building like a Sim City, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> I do like saying what these guys have learned in that short, short amount of time is. It's pretty impressive, um, and I probably apologize for no pressure, the, Titan. No pressure. <laughs> on how forced it was in there. But <laughs> um, no, I think I think uh, it's I, a I, unique I, unique skill set. Yes. Well, thank you, thank you guys all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Good thank luck. You. Oh. <laughs> all right. As women continue to make strides in the AEC industry, have we forgotten about tradeswomen? 
and the role they continue to play in breaking down gender barriers in construction. Tune in next month for an inside look at the production of Hard Hatted Woman, the first feature length documentary film about women in the trades. Thanks for listening to Building Conversations. Thank you.